All right, let's say a few things about electrical transport in metals, right? So you typically in metals have very high electrical conductivity and small resistivity, and that's because you have so many free electrons. We've already talked about that. Your band is right here. Your Fermi level is right in the middle of the band. And so all these electrons are available for conduction because they don't have to be promoted across a big gap. The empty spots are right here. You can put electrons you know, right there in the same band. So the large number of electrons available for conduction means that you're going to have good electrical conductivity in metals, right? Um, that said, uh, let's talk a little bit about how easy it is for these electrons to move through your material. Something that we should uh, just clarify is a definition of how electrons move in the presence of an electric field. If you have your electric field, we write it like this, right? So that's our electric field. What's going to happen is that your electrons are going to move opposite the direction of that field, right? So your elect your electrons themselves are going to travel that way. And then your holes, which are positively charged, and then your holes, which are positively charged, are going to move in the direction of the electric field, right? So that's just convention. That's how we define this, okay? Um, now, how about this? It says this, if the electric field is uniform all the way across your material, so it's not changing, then should the charge carrier, whether it be an electron, a hole, or an ion, because remember, if you have a, a cation, let's say I have like a titanium four plus ion, it will also move in an electric field, right? It will also feel a driving force to move. But will those continuously accelerate within the field, right? We've just said that if this field exists, shouldn't these things just keep on accelerating as long as they're in that field? So the answer is no, but it's a little bit tricky, right? It's the same reason why if you jump out of an airplane, so you've got your airplane up here, if you jump out of it and you start moving towards the ground, even though you are in the presence of a driving force to continue accelerating, right? You've got gravity acting on you, right? Gravitational forces acting on you the whole way that you're falling. What happens when you're skydiving? You don't continuously accelerating. You hit your terminal velocity, right? You hit a terminal velocity at which point you stop accelerating. And why is that? Well, because as you're falling, you've got the gravity force acting on you, but you also have a friction force on the air, which is acting opposite. And once those two uh, forces equal one another, you no longer accelerate. And so you reach your sort of terminal or maximum speed. Well, the same thing can happen in your material with electrons and holes or ions or whatever have you, right? They experience a driving force where they want to move, but as they're moving through your material, they experience a sort of friction, a friction force as they can't move infinitely fast through your material, right? The way that we talk about this in material science is with respect to scattering events. So again, let's say that your driving force is right here, right? right that's your electric field all the way across your material. And let's say you're talking about a hole, right? The absence of an electron. So this hole, it, instead of accelerating all the way across through here, it's going to accelerate and then have a scattering event where it might crash into an atom or something. And then it's going to scatter a little bit that way and it's going to scatter this way and it's going to undergo these scattering events but it's eventually going to work its way through the material, but only after crashing into things along the way, right? So we need a measure to account for this, you know, this scattering or this friction that it's experiencing as it scatters off of impurity atoms, dislocations, grain boundaries, vacancies, all these different things, vibrations, thermal vibrations, all those can scatter your material, right? So what we need is a measure of mobility, right? So your drift velocity, meaning the net speed with which you're able to travel through this material, that we call our V sub D. It's going to be equal to mu E, that's our mobility of the electron, multiplied by the electric field, right? Okay, so this is an important measure. Drift velocity, velocity think of it just like the terminal velocity when you jump out of an airplane. And then instead of um, air friction, we're going to talk about mobility, right? That's basically like the friction force acting on you. This allows us to come up with our final expression for conductivity in metals. Our electrical conductivity in metals should be equal to our number of carriers. We're going to call that N, right? That's the carrier concentration, the number of free electrons available on a per unit volume basis. We're going to multiply that by E, and that's the fundamental electron charge and the electron mobility. So which is, again, this measure of how much friction the electrons experience as they move through the material. Okay, That will give us a measure of our electrical conductivity. Okay, um, And then alternately, if you want to calculate resistivity, you would calculate conductivity and then take one over that. Now, what else can we say about resistivity? Resistivity, there's something called Matthiessen's rule that says that the overall resistivity is actually taking into account lots and lots of different 
uh, contributions. You have resistivity coming from thermal vibrations. You've got resistivity coming from impurities, coming from deformation, right? So dislocations in your material. So what you typically see is a plot like this. When you plot resistivity as a function of temperature, one thing that you see in metals is that it rises with temperature, right? Things become more resistive as you heat them up. That is a fundamental characteristic of metals. You heat it up, they don't conduct heat as well. And that makes sense because you're heating up, you're causing the atoms to vibrate more and more, right? And so those vibrations are going to scatter your electrons. Makes sense, right? Now, as you introduce impurities, that's also going to scatter them. And as you introduce dislocations, that's going to. So this allows us to do, do this little matching game, right? So let's match these materials. Um, where would, you know, what would be the lowest resistivity material? Would it be copper mixed with nickel? Would it be pure copper, copper with 5% nickel, Copper with 1%, but now it's deformed, or copper with 10%. Well, it's going to be the lowest one, so that's going to be this one right here. Our pure copper is going to be lowest. Now, depending on the influence of deformation and impurities, we would have to know this ahead of time. But let's assume that it's safe to bet that just a little bit of nickel would probably put us right there. And then a little bit of nickel with a little bit of deformation might put us there. 5% would put us there because it's even greater. And then 10% quite a bit of impurities are going to put us there. It might look something like that. That's the idea behind Matthiessen's rule, that you can add these resistivities linearly, okay? What else can we say? Um, again, we've already said that resistivity increases with temperature in metals. And here's uh, an example of how it also is affected by impurities. This is real data for copper. As you introduce nickel into copper, here's what the resistivity does, right? It rises, and then now you've reached the halfway point. So, right, you're not going to increase your like you've increased the maximum disorder there. So you'd expect this to start to fall down again as you approach um, pure nickel, right, on the other side, okay? It wouldn't reach the same amount because nickel and copper are not the same conductivity. They have different mobilities, right? But at least that's going to start to reduce your impurity scattering as you pass the 50% mark, okay? And then a few last couple things we'll say about this, just important metals to be aware of in the realm of electrical conductivity. You have oxygen-free high-conductivity copper. Um, we don't usually think about it as copper as having oxygen in it, but you can get oxygen both in the lattice and along the surfaces. And if you remove that, you get a really high conductivity copper. So that is extremely high. You've got aluminum, which is a really important electrical conductor because first off, it's only about half the conductivity of copper. So it's not as good. It's only half as good, but it's way cheaper, right? Copper is about three bucks a pound, at least when I put this slide together. And aluminum is about a dollar a pound, right? So you're paying a third the price for something half as good in conduction. Pretty good. Silver is our highest conductor. Um, solid solutions and alloys and deformations are all going to reduce the conductivity. And then you can end up with also some specialty alloys like nichrome, which is a mixture of nickel chrome and other things, which is designed to have a really high electrical conductivity if you're making things like heating elements, right? Okay, so that's electrical conductivity of metals.